All right, so welcome to the exciting part three of our King's Gambit series. Uh, we, got a, we got a new one. We already got people shaking their heads. Uh, all right, I promise this will be the, the last one. Uh, though I keep, I keep seeing all sorts of new variations we could cover. But uh, this will have to do it for the, the King's Gambit for, for a good while here. Um, either you like it or you love it. And <laughs> at least one person in the audience, they, they never play it. So uh, we'll do this one more time and we'll move on to, to something else. So we got a lot of new faces. So you guys are in for, for part three. So you missed the, the first two parts. But uh, we're going to be going over tonight the King's Gambit accepted. And tonight we're going to be going over the main, main line. So we've kind of been teasing you with the main line this whole time. And this time we're actually going to cover it. So we're going to be looking at the move knight to f3. And uh, our main focus here is going to be on the most common move, which is g5. And this is the, the main line. And uh, we sort of looked in our first video about what happens with an early bishop to c4 um, and why that is, is slightly a dubious move order. Uh, so today we'll be looking at h4, which immediately puts the question to the g-pawn before black has time to play moves like bishop to g7 and h6 and solidify the king side. And so this will be our starting point, which is the Kaiseritsky gambit. Uh, and that'll be our main focus. Uh, so I did promise that we would go over in this position uh, Fisher's defense, um, which is the move d6, which he calls in a pamphlet he wrote, called a bust to the king's gambit, a high class waiting move. And the point of the move d6 is you still want to play the move g5 to protect your pawn, but you're preventing the move knight to e5. And it's a, it's a kind of fun read, so I suggest to everyone out there that you goes and you read it. Um, OK, it was written a while back, so the analysis isn't as perfect as it is now in the, the modern computer age. But he says some very hilarious stuff. So I kind of want to read a little bit of the, the things that he said in his Bust to a King's Gambit. So of this move, um, and he wrote about the King's Gambit in general, that the King's Gambit has lost popularity, but not sympathy. Analysts treat it with kids' gloves and seem reluctant to demonstrate an outright refutation. Uh, to this day, the opening has been analyzed romantically, not scientifically. Moderns seem to share the unconscious attitude that caused old timers to curse stubborn, stubborn Steinitz. He took the beauty out of chess. Um, so he's saying in the intro to his, his pamphlet that, uh, OK, the, the King's Gambit is not something that most people look at scientifically. They don't like objectively look at it. Um, historically, it's been sort of a romantic opening where people sack wild stuff and they play sort of dubiously and it all works out. And uh, I do tend to agree with that. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Each opening sort of has its, its own feeling to it. And there is something about the King's Gambit that makes people play in this romantic, sacrifice everything for checkmate style. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, a, a true statement. But so he's trying to say uh, the King's Gambit is refuted. And he does write that. Uh, he says, the refutation of any gambit begins with accepting it. In my opinion, the King's Gambit is busted. It loses by force. So he's saying people have, you know, you've looked at this. Um, just kind of with rose-tinted glasses, you really like this opening because of all the, the wild attacking games. But it's uh, not only dubious, but losing. That's, his, that's Fisher's claim. And he analyzes these lines. Um, he talks about bishop to c4 as his main line. d4 is the more popular move today, but they often transpose. And just to go a, a few moves further, he says h6 x glam. Like, <laughs> like that's great. Um, and OK, I mean, it's, it's probably the most obvious move, but uh, if you've played this position enough. And so we get a, a position like this. And here he gives as his main line, let's drag this guy out of the way, uh, queen to b3, which nowadays is a super rare move. But I guess that was all the rage back then. This was the main line. Now it's like the fifth most popular line. And OK, black plays queen e7. And OK, this is, it's just become an unpopular line. But he does analyze what is still today the main line, which is g3. And after the subsequent moves, he has further funny commentary on this position uh, after knight to d2. So he says here the strongest move is queen to e7. And he says of this move, uh, bishop to f6, uh, Juve and other analysts betray their soft-mindedness towards this opening by giving the inferior bishop to f6 
unclear double exclam. And he put unclear in quotes. Like that's the, the analyst saying, yeah, this is unclear. Um, and then he, he goes on to say, too, that the pawn on f3 is a bone in White's throat, so why force him to sacrifice it anyway, uh, which is what will typically happen. Though he does say also of this position, uh, he gives this line. And then he says, but black is clearly winning after the following moves. Black does this, and he castles, and then he wins. So, so yeah, some very, very interesting commentary. And I also like the famous line that he gives at the, the very end of his thing. Um, of course, white can play differently, in which case he merely loses differently. Uh, so it's now that's become a, a famous line. And perhaps the biggest criticism I've seen of his work is that it's like two or three pages. So how could you refute this opening with such short analysis? But it's, uh, it's a really entertaining read, so I'd hope people that are interested, they can go find it and uh, read it for themselves. It makes me wish Fisher wrote a lot more stuff, because he's funny and he's hard on people. Uh, and it's, yeah, his writing is, is really great. But we will return to our main line today, so after knight to f3. We're going to be looking at lines involving g5. And uh, so this is it. This is the, the main line the Kaivaritsky gambit. And we're going to look at the three most popular moves in this position. The most popular move is knight to f6, the Berlin defense. Uh, we'll also take a look at d6, which is the Kolish defense. And we're going to look at the, the opening with perhaps the coolest name of the night, the long whip defense. So black creates this long whip with his pawns. And uh, having played this opening now for about three weeks, because we're three weeks into this, uh, I've noticed this actually is a popular variation online, but it doesn't have a very good uh, reputation. So obviously, this is Black saying, I'm going to take the pawn, and I'm just going to keep it, and solidify my pawns. And usually, Black tries to be as greedy as possible, which is something they used to do back in the 1800s. One person would gambit stuff and get all their pieces out and checkmate the other person, but that other person would you know, try to hold on to all of their stuff. And over the time, we've sort of learned that this greed isn't always good, especially in the king's gambit. Uh, so it's, it's usually better to get your pieces out. So when we get to the main line, we'll see, OK, you get your pieces out, and then you get a, a good game. And uh, OK, what you do normally in this opening, sort of the point of why would you have your knight out here so early, obviously d6 is going to kick it away in the near future. But it does have the point that you're looking at f7, which is the main focal point. So bishop to c4. And black has to think about how he's going to defend the f7 pawn. So in this position, already there's uh, two main ways of defending it. So defending with the queen doesn't really do anything. But uh, the two main ways of defending are perhaps the most obvious, knight to h6. And the less obvious and funnier, Rook to h7. So uh, finally, black develops a piece, and it's a rook. So <laughs> it's hard to think of any other game where you move your rook first. But uh, this actually is seen here in our, our future game. I'll show you a game with Bronstein where this move was played. And the point is uh, you're keeping the h6 square free so that you can put your bishop here and defend your f pawn. That's the point. Um, so, but first, let's take a look at the more popular move, which is knight to h6. All right, and we've, we've doubled the number of quarries in our audience, so we're doing pretty good, doing pretty good. <laughs> um, OK, knight to h6, this is the more common move. Uh, it defends the f pawn. And after the moves d4 and d6, the knight doesn't have a good sacrifice on f7. So it goes back, and uh, we're about to win the pawn on f4. So this is a typical. Uh, defensive resource that black has in these types of positions. Instead of just letting the pawn fall, black plays f3. And uh, with this, OK, he's, he's trying to keep the king side closed. And black just needs to uh, catch up in development. And a, a typical line would be after bishop to e7, threatening the h pawn, bishop e3, so that when you take, uh, we can put our king here on d2 outside of the bishop. And it's a, it's a very interesting position. So this is sort of what you might expect when you play this, the, the long stock variation, uh, the long whip variation, is this sort of thing. Uh, and there was a Morphe game 
where black made a big mistake. Morphe actually put his bishop on f4. But black made the big mistake of taking here, uh, which was disastrous for him. Because once white took back, he put stuff on the f file, and really bad things happened really quickly. But this is sort of the, the main line of this, this variation. Um, but let's, let's look at this game. And this is actually the game between uh, David Bronstein and a player named Peter Dubinin, um, who was an, an IM and a, a correspondence grandmaster. So he was very good at correspondence back in the days before you could just use your computers. So if you're a grandmaster in correspondence today, it means you're really good at using computers, which, which is usually allowed. Um, so OK, so he was, he was a decently strong player. But Bronstein, um, this was played in uh, 1947 which was when Bronstein was, was particularly good. And he was known for his aggressive attacking style. So an opening like this uh, is something you could expect from him. And his opponent played really, really greedily. Uh, so we'll see in this position. So after rook to h7, d4. So now if, if d6, we can either take on f7 or we can go back to d3. Also, we're attacking the f-pawn. And so this was sort of the point of your um, your rook move here was you're going to put the bishop on h6. So that's why you didn't put a knight there. It is also possible to play the move d6, which is a little more common and is likely to be similar to the variation we saw just a moment ago, where after f3 uh, we take, and now they can attack our pawn. So we move our bishop and our king goes here. And you get this sort of unusual position where white should be a little bit better. All right, but in this game, bishop to h6. Uh, OK, so he's just, he wants everything. I want the pawn. I want it all. And so white just calmly develops. And so after either knight to c6 or d6, white had the same thing in mind. Now putting the knight on d3 doesn't make as much sense because your d4 pawn's not protected. Um, so he just goes for it. He takes on f7. OK, so after some captures, already there's a tactic for white in the king's gambit. Who would have thought? Um, so what did white play in this position? I guess we'll get the, the audience. How did this audience grow so much so fast? We started with nobody. Now we have like a full class. This is great. Excellent. Bishop takes f4. Um, and the point is, hopefully uh, everybody can see it, after he takes back, white castled. And black decided just to go for the pawn, which is OK. There was a game that also saw this greedy move, where it's I'm just going to protect my bishop and keep it forever. Uh, but this fails to e5. And let's, OK, maybe I'll, I'll just go to h6, keep my guy protected. Uh, but this also just fails due to queen to d2 uh, attacking the pinned piece. So obviously, we can't take the, the queen. And this should be very good for white. So he probably saw that. He's a pretty greedy guy, but I guess he wasn't that greedy. Uh, so he took here. And OK, it looks a little bit scary. But who is it scarier for? So white takes here. And so it looks like white has, black has two pieces for the rook. So black is up a small margin of material here. But uh, you'll notice these guys aren't doing so much. He's sort of in a bad way. And white could play the immediate knight to d5. It's a very good choice here. But he did something that good players like to do. He used all of his pieces. So he just played queen to d2 with the idea of bringing his last rook into the game and putting some pressure here on f7. Uh, and it's, it's not really obvious that black can do a whole lot to stop it. Black is already in a really bad way just due to the fact that white's pieces are so active. So after d6, he brought the rook over. Now, it's a good indication that black is probably losing when you see black's next move. And it's the computer move. So, but still, if you have to play knight to d8, <laughs> you're, you're probably losing. Uh, it's not often you see a knight on d8. Obviously, it has the point that now rook f7 is a blunder. But now you're, you're just not going to use any of these pieces at all. So it doesn't matter that you're up <laughs> one point of material when you don't use any of your material and your opponent uses everything. 
All right, so he got his knight into the game. And black played bishop to d7. And he should probably be hoping that white takes on c7 because then the knight is going in the wrong direction. And then the rook comes to c8, and maybe the rook gets active. Uh, so obviously, he has no intention of just going to win the pawn. That's, that's clearly not the point of his play. But he needs to find a way to increase his activity. Uh, so I will go ahead and I'll, I'll ask the audience uh, who can find the move that white played in this position. Yeah. I'm looking at queen e3 and then e5. He might be able to do e5 just as is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the suggestion was queen e3 followed by e5, which does make sense. But yeah, he did go for it right away. So yeah, he's just opening up the game as much as possible. Uh, and black took. So white took back. OK, very good. And now black decided to play bishop to c6. So his idea, presumably, is just to take the knight and reduce the amount of material. But OK, that alone might not be, be a whole enough to, to help black here. OK, and he continued to play very actively. So in this position, e6. So, so he's getting control over f7. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible if the bishop were still here, because then we could take this. So he takes advantage of the fact, let's turn this volume off. All right, All right for Ben Simon, we'll keep it there, just in case I make some more mistakes. You'll get to hear it. Uh, how do I make a mistake? I can't even make mistakes. Um, OK, so you have access to f7 again. And so obviously, if the knight takes, then we get to put a rook on f7. So instead, white, uh, sorry, black took the knight. And now the game is nice and wide open. We have diagonals to the king. We have access to f7. But our pawns attacked. Oh, no. So what did white play in this position? And I probably wouldn't ask if it was queen takes bishop, though that should be winning too. Queen d4 is also winning. And so is queen here. Like, everything wins. Uh, <laughs> but in the game, rook f7. All right, sacrificing. So we're thinking about checkmate here. Um, so he takes. We take back with the rook. All right, king goes back in the corner. And now? Queen d3. Queen d3? You're threatening checkmate? All right, so and this does nothing. I, I don't I have at least a perpetual now, right? Maybe I don't, but I have at least this move. I mean, yeah, you can, you can come back and block. But yeah, but you have the right idea, right? You want to get that queen into the action involved with the rook. Um, yeah, you're down to just two pieces, so you got to. <laughs> awesome, yeah. All right, we got queen c3, which is just as good as queen d4, but it's farther away. <laughs> Uh, which is kind of cool. So we're not interested in your bishop. We're here just to win material. You don't have a lot of options. So you have to block on f6, either with the knight or the queen. So he went with his knight. But uh, uh, the game is now over after here. He played the computer move. <laughs> queen takes rook. Um, OK, resigning was also a good option in this position. And black played a few more moves. So he just went and he took this. Um, and now is the time to resign. So not, not before this. Um, OK, so a great illustration, though, here of what uh, can happen all the time in the king's gambit. One side is really, really greedy. We take the pawn. We try to hold it for way too long. But what really matters in these positions the most is the quality of the pieces and, and your piece activity. So uh, a really good display of the things that can happen when black just holds on to everything and white gets all of his pieces out and checkmates his opponent. So. All right, very excellent game. We'll, we'll look at it some more. All right. And this time, we'll flip the board. So we've shown a lot of games that are good for white. But eventually, in this dubious opening, we'll have to show some games for black. So we have it again. The king's gambit accepted. And we get the main line. So in this position, 
We'll look at the other two moves, both which have a very good reputation. Um, we'll show one more game, a more recent game, in the Kolisch variation. And uh, before that, we'll go ahead and we'll have a, main, a look at the, the main move here, the Berlin defense, uh, which is uh, you know, one, of the, one of the best ways. So unlike all the suspicious openings, in the main line, you develop your pieces. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at good play for a change. And OK, so the, sort of the point of having your knight on e5 is to target the f7 pawn. And how does black stop you from just taking on f7 and winning immediately? Yeah, d5. So if you take with the bishop, I'll play knight takes bishop. So white typically takes with the pawn. And the main move here is bishop d6, uh, asking your, your knight what he wants to do. Now, the main line is d4, which is the most solid way to play. <clears throat> and it uh, appears that I've lost all of my analysis. Oh, no. But in this line, uh, we'll come back to the more exciting line, the rice gambit, which is to simply castle and leave your knight on pre. We'll come to that, which is, is you know typically wilder, which is saying something, because even this variation is pretty crazy. Uh, but only if I can remember it. So in this position, uh, typically, you'd guard your F pawn. And OK, so you guarded this guy, but now your G pawn's hanging. Uh, I mean, OK, so this usually happens. And white takes here, which okay, threatens some discoveries, followed by queen takes h5. So you, you play here, which threatens the knight for a second time. Uh, and when they go away, uh, you play here. You get a line like this, uh, which is very complicated, obviously. And to play this way, you sort of need to know a whole lot about this variation. So it's something that you would probably want to be well prepared for, which is probably why at the amateur level it doesn't occur so often. So I've just been playing hundreds of blitz games in this. And people seem to rarely accept it, because you need to know a whole lot. And they don't face the king's gambit very often. But it also makes me feel like I should keep playing the King's Gambit because nobody knows what to do. And then you just get good positions right away. They never play the critical stuff. They're just like, ah, I don't want to learn that. <laughs> and then you get good positions. So now I'm going to keep playing it. Uh, OK, but so this is the main line. But even more exciting and more dubious is back in this position to play the Rice Gambit, which is just a castle not defending the knight. The point being, once you take the knight, uh, we have some e-file tricks here. OK. Uh, queen e7, which might look kind of scary, right? Because you're putting your queen on the same file here as the rook. So your, your queen and king are lined up with the rook on the e file. Usually, this spells big disaster. But uh, here, it actually gives black a little bit more time to uh, get on with some of the moves that he wants to play. And the problem for white is the immediate d4, which might look crushing at first sight, just doesn't work. Because what does black play? Bishop yeah, bishop takes d4. So obviously, if you take my bishop with your queen, I take your rook. But if white thinks, all right, I'm clever, all right, now the joke is back on you. I just moved my king instead. Well, then you just play bishop to e3. And uh, OK, black is, is crushing it here. So instead, c3 preparing d4. And now uh, we preemptively protect the f pawn. So we know d4 is coming. Uh, so we gotta, what are we going to do about that? Well, we'll defend it just so that you don't take back with your rook. Now, if you take it back with your rook, I take it. Um, and every human here has played an inferior move. But it seems like all humans agree in this position, you pin the knight. So you're once again threatening rook to e5. But perhaps the most critical, though untested, is a crazy move. Queen takes g4, which lines the queen up with the bishop. And it opens the g file. Uh, uh, but perhaps the best is just to take on d4. Uh, with the same idea, now the queen and rook are, are lined up. But since it's, it's check, we get to move here. And uh, does anyone see what, what black should play here? 
Yeah, knight to g3, forcing white to play his only move, which is to take the knight. And after some complicated trading, we get a position like this where black should be better based on the fact that his pieces will reach more active squares. And it's actually white that has more pawn weaknesses here. So you can imagine rook to g8 to g4 uh, with pressure on these pawns. Although also, I mean, of course, white has his own activity as well. But uh, OK, this should be, be quite good for black. All right, so we'll return now. All right, so we'll return now to uh, this position. And we'll look at the game between Alexei Fedorov and Alexei Shirov. So the Battle of the Alexis. So white is a 2600 player, and black is a 2700 player. Um, so OK, so a very high level fight. And for some reason, I see Shirov in playing the King's Gambit as both sides in the database. But he's perhaps somebody you don't want to play the King's Gambit against. He seems, he seems to win pretty handily when he's on the black side. Uh, he's you know, famous for his tactics and his, his fire on the board. So when you play this way, you know, sometimes he just crushes you. He's very good in these types of positions. And he chose the Kolish defense, uh, which should equalize very easily for black, which is you know, one of the main reasons why people don't play this way as white very often at the top, top level. Um, OK, my knight's attacked. I'll take your g-pawn. And now knight to f6. And already, his opponent played rather passively. And he's a pretty good opponent. Um, Fedorov is sort of an expert in the king's gambit. He's played it 100 times as white. Uh, he's had won all sorts of brilliant games with it. But this wasn't one of them. In this game, he chose to go all the way back to f2. And he got into some trouble immediately. The more common move is to take on f6, which is kind of an indication that white is already thinking about trying to equalize the position. So uh, black gets his pieces out. And in general, black will get his, his pieces out a little bit faster than white. And the fact that you have doubled pawns isn't really a huge issue. And it even gives you the g file. Um, so a line like this would, would occur. And after this move, black's move might surprise you, the main, main theoretical move here. Because I think a lot of people would just grab their queen and go back to d8, defend their c-pawn. But you can even play the move queen to g6. And white will play a move like d3. And you'll, you'll get this sort of as the main starting position. Uh, but to understand why, let's, let's take this. All right, so you got to move your king. And if we're really greedy, what is black going to play? All right, Ben Simon's on the board. Queen g3. And now for the big dispute. Uh, I showed this position to Danny Machuca. And I said, you can checkmate this way or this way. Which one is more attractive? And we couldn't agree. So I'll, I'll pull the audience. Who thinks knight to d4 is the more attractive checkmate? All right, we got like three hands. All right, what about bishop to g4? Ooh, four. Ooh, I guess, I guess Danny was right all along. People, the people have spoken. It's, it's bishop to g4. Um, I quite liked the knight move. I thought the other move was a little bit more obvious because it's a skewer. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of like the knight move. And he made fun of me. He's like, oh, you just moved the same pieces. You got to use all your pieces. Uh, OK, so that, that was the important position of the lecture. But now we'll go back. And we'll look at the move that was actually played in this game, uh, which was knight to f2. All right, so we got knight to f2 here on the board. Um, OK, so rook to g8, which is kind of annoying, because now it's, it's really difficult to develop this bishop anywhere. So white played d4, very sensible. Uh, and now we protect our pawn which is sort of a typical thing. It might seem odd to put your, your bishop over on the side. But this is a really annoying pawn. We don't want to just give up the pawn for free. So it's very typical in these lines to defend it with your bishop. And uh, after a couple more developing moves, 
White played a move that was one of the top computer choices. But if you keep playing this through this whole line, they both played like the computer lines, and then eventually the computer's like, oh, black's winning. <laughs> so white played a move that looks pretty good, and the computer's like, yeah, that's pretty good. But then if you keep going five, 10 moves down the line, it's like, uh-oh, white's already losing. So uh, you know, not easy to see, but uh, it's black to move here. And I guess I'll, I'll start letting you guys play like Shirov. What would you guys play here as black? It's not like a brilliant tactic or anything. It's just a, just a move. All right, so in this position, uh, he took the knight on d5. And white took back. And OK, before moving the knight, he threw this check in. And white uh, defended with the bishop, which obviously undefends the g-pawn. But if you defend with the queen, we can either trade on e2 and then take on d4. Or we can take on d4 right away. And this isn't a very pleasant position for white. We have some threats um, going on here. And our pieces are coming in very quickly. So this wasn't chosen. Instead, he defended with the bishop. But it might seem like, OK, so I had to undefend my g-pawn. I'll have to take care of that after you take care of your knight. Um, but what are you going to do? Are you really going to go to b4? All right, so he did. All right, you know, it's kind of strange. What are you doing out there? Because now I play c4, and I'm going to check you and win your knight. So that's, that's white's threat. But black said, bring it on. And he played bishop to f5. A very strong move. Obviously, uh, I mean, if you don't check and win my knight, then I'm going to c2. So what are you going to do? Um, so he did it. He gets off the e-file. Now he can bring his other rook over to e8. And so after this capture, rook to e8. Uh, and white is under an incredible amount of pressure now. So he, he fell for the trap, but now he's completely winning. Um, OK, yeah, when, when Shira falls for the trap, normally that's a bad sign for you. Uh, OK, so here, yeah, just all of black's pieces are great. And, and these guys are not great. You're, you're not so good either. I mean, neither are you or you or you. You're not, you're not good either. So, But you, you got some good pawns here. Those guys are pretty good. Um, all right, yeah, and all of Black's pieces are just all over you. So here he took um, with lots of threats, like lots. And if you put this on the computer, we had to go down, like, how many moves can Black play that, like, win? And it's, like, 15 moves. You know, like, OK, like, this move wins, and this move wins, and this wins, and this, like, every, every move wins. Um, but among your threats, the biggest one is perhaps queen takes h4. You can't take with your rook, because then I drop down to g1. And also, uh, f3 is a, is a pretty serious threat. You can take my bishop with check, but I'll move over to g8, and then you, you've got a lot of problems. Um, and obviously, the positional threat of a5, stopping b4. Um, but OK, that's, that's not uh, the main thing. So you kind of got to get off this, <laughs> out of this pin, attack the rook. And um, I've shown this position to a lot of people, and they don't play the, the right move here, which seems kind of strange. Now, it's not a brilliant move. He just put his rook back, <laughs> and, which is fine. Um, it's also possible to put your bishop here immediately. He puts it there in just a second. Um, all right, so now maybe you'll get your bishop out. And uh, black here now decided to play bishop to e4. Uh, so obviously, if you, if you go here, I'm taking on h4, which is a pretty big issue. So he stays on his pawn. And now uh, a very strong move. Uh, we would like to have another one of these pieces over here, so we'd be making some threats. So f5, giving the queen access to f7, which is very annoying. Uh, white decided to take. And another added bonus is now we can take back with a pawn. And our pawns are very strong, so we're thinking about playing f3 or e3. And you're just really strangled here as white. You just don't have any good moves here. Uh, he put his bishop here. And then 
after e3, shutting down this guy, which locks out that guy. Uh, he moved his bishop again. <clears throat> and yeah, things are, things are pretty bad. But um, let's see, so queen g7. And now after this move, which isn't the best, but man, it's, it's hard to play white. Uh, black played one more move here, and then the game ended. So you can go ahead, you can pause your video at home. It's a nice little move. Um, I guess it's not the greatest tactic of all time, but it, it's a nice move. Okay, hopefully some of you are able to find this at home. Uh, rook to g2. You know, just with the nice idea um, that if you take with the bishop, we can play the move e2, winning everything. Uh, so here, white had had enough. It's just, he's been tortured long enough. Uh, so he just, he, he gave it up here. So a very strong example of good preparation, presumably, by Alexei Shirov. And how quickly you can get into trouble playing this way as white, especially if black is well prepared. If black knows what he's doing and he plays the critical lines, uh, he's usually at least either equal or winning in most of the main lines. So that's why people don't play it at the top level, because their opponents are well prepared, and then you just lose. So... But uh, returning to what Fisher said, it is sort of in the spirit of the opening to play sort of romantically with this opening. So I would recommend that people do take a, a serious look at it. Uh, it is a lot of fun. You do see lots of brilliant and, and beautiful games. Uh, so I'd, I'd take the risk, play the King's Gambit. It's a lot of fun. And as always, hit like, share, subscribe, and tell me uh, what do you think? What do you think about the King's Gambit? And what do you guys want to see next week? All right, thanks everybody.